Welcome to the Arts Access Florida podcast series, When Freedom Rings. In this six-part series, we speak with our Black and Brown community on what has transpired in the art world since the emancipation of slavery on June 19, 1865. We have open conversations on their experiences as people of color and their contributions to art, community, and education. The series highlights their continued efforts to move the needle forward. This is when freedom rings. Welcome to episode one, Juneteenth. The newly minted federal holiday is a lot more than just another day off from work. Today we speak with an educator and professor at USF, Gabriel Robinson, on the history before, during, and after the day we now call Juneteenth. From the significance of the color of the flag to how her experiences have brought her to where she is today. She says that this is no ordinary holiday, and before we celebrate, let's educate. Today, for our first episode, we will be discussing Juneteenth, and we have our guest, Gabrielle Robinson, here with us today. So, would you please just introduce yourself to our audience? Okay, a brief introduction. Um, I'm a Baltimore native, and um, I am the proud daughter of the late Bishop Harvey Robinson and my mom, Catherine, who were married for 62 years before he died. And I'm bringing that up because um, when we get into my love for black history, they're, they're, they were so instrumental in that. Um, I teach at the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg, and I'm a proud member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Before we get into June 19th, 1865, we really need to talk about what was happening before that. So could you give us just a brief, if it can be brief, um, idea of what was going on? No, you know, um, okay, so the Civil War um, actually didn't end until 65, even though the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 63. Mm -hmm. But before that, of course, you know, everyone knows about slavery. But what I think is what's fascinating to me about that time period is that even in the midst of, you know, black people being enslaved, there were so many black people who were doing incredible things in the midst of that. Mm -hmm. Um, For example, you know, if um, black people were not considered to be citizens of the United States, which is why a lot of people, when they talk about the national anthem, which was written in 1814, it didn't include us. Right. And so there were a lot of black people who, you know, in Northern states were inventors and creators and in Southern states, but they couldn't receive patents for things because they weren't citizens. And the only way you could get a patent was to be a citizen. And so um, one person I'm going to talk about, and I think this is important because what I like to stress about black people, a lot of a lot of what people know about us is just slavery and civil rights. Right. You know, mm-hmm. and I think it's important to know that, yes, in the midst of that slavery in 1821, Thomas Jennings was the bl- first black person to receive a patent. He was in New York. Um, the way he had to get that patent, he was also one of the first black people that they considered to be a citizen because you couldn't get a patent without being a citizen. And the reason why they did that was because what he patented was dry cleaning. Oh. Yeah, it, he called it dry scouring, but it is exactly what we're doing now. But I guarantee you, if you go Google Thomas Jet Black Man Dry Cleaning, uh-huh. you will see his name. And so dry cleaning isn't black or white. It's dry cleaning. Everybody does that. Mm-hmm. But people don't know that. And he actually, his wife was actually a slave. And so because she was a slave, she couldn't become a full, she couldn't be free, but she became an indentured, indentured servant. And then he eventually bought her freedom. freedom. But, but that's, that's what was going on in the midst of all the misery and everything um, that black people face being slaves, there were so many of us. There's progress going on. There was progress going on that has impacted us from then until now. That's amazing. I didn't know any of that. (laughs) So you talked about your parents Mm -hmm. and how instrumental they were for you and and a lot of the knowledge that you've gained and the passion for uh, really understanding black people and their history. Exactly. 
What what was that that they gave you? Oh my gosh. Well, they gave us the Encyclopedia of Black History. We mm-hmm. had in our home, we had um, Encyclopedia Britannica, um, but we also had the entire Encyclopedia of Black History. And they would have us read the encyclopedias and we had to mm-hmm. do book reports, reports, not for school, but for them on what we learned. Ooh. And that actually, at the time, I was like, are you kidding me? Right. But as I got older, I appreciated it so much. And another thing that I got was uh, the beauty, like my mom grew up in Norristown, Pennsylvania, which is outside of Philly. My dad was from a small town called Williston, Florida. We settled in Baltimore, but every summer we would drive from Baltimore to Williston and I I had the experience that a lot of people don't have now mm-hmm. where my great grandmother lived to be almost 108. Wow. My grandmother lived to be three weeks shy of her 106th birthday. And I had my great aunts and we'd sit on the porch and snap peas and, you know, shuck corn as a little girl. And they would talk to me and tell, tell me stories. You know, my other brothers and sisters were there, but I was the one who really just liked to sit at their feet and hear all these incredible stories about not just the things that we went through as black people, but how we came to get that sense of community mm-hmm. and, you know, all the wisdom and, and the different uh, ways that we had of healing illness, you know, because we couldn't go to the doctor. So it was like, you know, yeah. you, you do this and you do that. And just all of those things that really um, set in motion my direction in life to where I am now. I kind of, it, it, like it brought me back to when I was a kid. I can't remember if my dad or my mom made me do book reports. Oh, okay. But I do recall, you know, my dad sitting us down and being like, okay, this summer we're watching Roots. And it wasn't like, we're going to just sit down and watch it. It was like, we're watching it. We're discussing it. Right. You know, it was a, I, I remember it clearly, clearly. And I remember it so well because it was summertime. And I, I was like, I'm going to be, I want to go swimming. This is depressing. Like, why are we watching this? But it's something that now I, I'm so grateful for that, like, they took the time to try to teach me something that they knew I wouldn't necessarily get in school. Right. So I just have a little bit more understanding of where I come from, what does it mean, and so it would inform my decision making. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Let's talk about Juneteenth. Okay. Because um, there's the the idea of Juneteenth versus what it really means. Right. Um, there's a lot of confusion. Um, so what what is Juneteenth first? Off? Okay, so Juneteenth is short for June 19th. Mm-hmm. And basically, this the Emancipation Proclamation was signed on January 1st, 1863. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it didn't, the the Civil War didn't end until April 9th, 1865. Okay, so, and and the Emancipation Proclamation, and I had to bring my notes because I wanted to make sure. um, It didn't instantly free any enslaved people. It was only the places under Confederate control and everything. So I think that's something that a lot of people don't, know. Uh, don't really know or understand and not slave holding border states. So a lot of people were going to Florida because there wasn't fighting there and it was it was slaveholder friendly, mm-hmm. you know, for lack of a better word. OK, so then um, on June 19th, 1865, General U.S. General Gordon Granger made it to Galveston, Texas, and he read the proclamation. This is what he said. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. And that was 250,000 slaves, people who were still, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So then that very next year, like Juneteenth has been celebrated in Texas since 1866. And so that's how it got started. Okay. I'm just thinking about, for me, which I'm wondering if it's the case for maybe the audience or who's listening. Uh I didn't really start hearing about Juneteenth until in the last like four to five years. I think I knew the date. Like I knew that that had, I knew the emancipation had happened on June 19th, but I hadn't really 
it wasn't like July 4th. Right. You right. know, it hadn't been embedded into my, my right. head, which is crazy because it's the same. It's celebrating freedom. It was actually called Freedom Day. Um, okay. Back in the day. And in 1979, it became a state holiday in Texas. And then other states followed suit. And to be quite honest, it wasn't until June of last year that it became a national yeah, holiday. A federal holiday. But I can on it, I can honestly say I don't know one black person who was like, let's make Juneteenth a federal holiday. Because initially, because you see what happened, then Walmart starts selling mm-hmm. ice cream. And then you have the, it's the freedom for me napkins and whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. And they had to pull the ice cream because nobody, that was like our day, you know, like our little secret almost, even though, um, as time has gone on, it may not, it may not have been, I'm relatively new to Florida. So I don't mm-hmm. know. It may, it may be bigger in other parts of Florida, but I know in Texas it's huge. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm not sure sense. that it's big here or yet. Right. I don't think people even know about it. Part of me is glad it's been made a federal holiday because when something's given that stamp, people tend to pay attention a little bit more. And then some people pay attention the wrong ways, but there's also people who pay attention in the right ways. Right. And they go and they learn and they get more information. Right. So I think that that it's been made a holiday, hopefully over the years, people will even know what June, Juneteenth is. Exactly. Exactly. Know what it is. So since this holiday has been already been celebrated for how many years did you say? Over Since 1866. Over, yeah. Yeah. What What does the holiday really mean? There are right? certain things that are supposed to take place on Juneteenth. You're supposed to have music, barbecue, but you're also supposed to have prayer services um, on Juneteenth, which um, actually this year, Juneteenth is on Father's Day, which is yes. Sunday. So there will be a lot of people in church. So what's the significance of the food? Okay, so the food... Um, go, dates back to the enslaved Yoruban and Congo people who were brought to Texas in the 19th century. And in particular, there should be red foods. Okay. okay? Red velvet cake, strawberry cake, uh, red lemonade, big red soda, which I think is specific to Texas. I don't think you can buy big red everywhere, mm-hmm. but red goes back to that. And a lot of people on Juneteenth are supposed to wear red. That's the reason why it goes back to the the Yoruban people, people from the Congo, the red, the red foods that they brought here, watermelon, ah, you know, I every see. different things like that. And that's where that red Okay. Why it's so important. So the red is significant in the food and then you the red is significant in the flag. So why right. is it significant in the flag? Okay, so the red and the flag, actually, there's red, white, and blue. The flag was created in 1997 by Ben Haith, who was the founder of the National Juneteenth Celebration Foundation. And he made the colors red, white, and blue the same as the American flag, but it's a reminder to Black people that to enslaved the descendants of black people that we are and were Americans. Talk about the confusing nature of the flag. Because okay. Because there's the red, white, and blue flag, and there's the more commercial flag, which I believe is red, green, and black. Right. The Pan-African flag. So one flag is specific to the African diaspora. That's the red, black, and green flag. Okay. That's why. And But the red, white, and blue um Juneteenth flag, which actually had the date of June 19th, um, 1865 added, I think in like 2006 or 2007, Mm -hmm. that flag is specific to Juneteenth. Okay. So the only time you should see that flag is Juneteenth. Okay. Whereas the Pan-African flag, you can see that. Okay. So the flag, both flags are significant and make, and have meaning. There's right. not oh, one definitely. or the other, but the June yeah. 19th flag is typically for actual June, June 19th. T- it was created for that day. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, because I was very confused about that, and I yeah. don't think a lot of people knew that, and I did not even know there was a, an the official actual Juneteenth flag. Yeah, a lot of people don't, but yeah, it's been around since, like I said, since 97. So with the Juneteenth flag itself, it okay. has a specific design. Right. It has some stars. I think it has like a little uh, kind of 
A star. It's called the Nova. It's the, the it's Nova. The Nova. Uh huh. Can you can you describe that flag okay. and what it means? So there's one star, one big white star. That it's it's a dual meaning. In the center of the flag, you have the red. There's an arc, the star, a nova around the flag, and then the blue. The white star represents the Lone Star State of Texas, but it's also a metaphor for Black Americans. For Black, like we are the star. We rose from this. We are the star as well. The nova, which is the cloudburst, um, that represents a new beginning. So you have the star and then you have the burst yeah. around it. And that's our new beginning for black people. The arc, it divides the blue from the red. That represents a new horizon ah. for black people. Right. And it reveals the opportunities and promise. So, you know, all of these things. And then the date was added um, in 2006 or 2007. I think it was 2007, June 19th. Um, 1865 on the end of the flag but that wasn't you know it wasn't initially when the flag was first um, presented in 97 the date wasn't on there but they oh, added okay. it. yeah so everything on there has, has an a exact meaning. Meaning. yes exact awesome meaning. I yeah. love that I and love that's why that. I think it's important that people know that know that mm-hmm. I had a conversation with someone and they were like well I don't like that it's red white and blue I'm like but you got to understand why it's red white you may not and I get it you know because mm-hmm. it's too close to the American they prefer the uh, pan-african you know red black and green I said but there's a reason why and so I think as an educator you know let's let me educate. educate you let's, you educate. let's educate when it comes to Juneteenth if there's one thing you want anyone to take away from it or to gain from it, what would that be? What would you want them to to learn? Well, see, here's the interesting thing about it. There's this huge push about not teaching history, mm-hmm. you know, but how can you have a national holiday like Juneteenth and then not tell people what, what it's, it's a, for? Yeah. Yeah. So what do we, you know, so... That's what I want people to do, to dig deeper, to really start researching and say, hey, you know, what is this Juneteenth for a lot of people who may not have ever heard of it, Mm -hmm. who may not know what it is, you know, don't just take it as, um, because it's on a Sunday, a lot of places are going to celebrate on that Monday, the Mm -hmm. 20th. So don't just take it as a day off, but like really do some study and try to educate yourself or reach out to someone and say, Hey, you know, what do you know about Juneteenth? Right. You know, and find out about it. And I think you'll be uh, pleasantly su- surprised about it. And then get, get all the red foods and the red, everything that you can. <laughs> so you're an educator. Right. You're a part of a lot of groups on campus. Right. Um, how, how do you feel like we can continue to spread this knowledge to make, what Juneteenth really is more common knowledge by not being afraid to speak again um we're living in a time when our history is being attacked like there's an attack on knowledge Mm -hmm. pretty much and so we have to be willing to say as an educator like I can't I cannot not teach you get what I'm saying like I have to educate students that's my that's my purpose it's more than just a passion that is something that has been instilled in me from a very young child and so I've always said and I and I actually wrote a column about this last year in the times that educated people would never tolerate racism they mm-hmm. never tolerate. And so because I believe that with every fiber of my being, anytime I have the opportunity to educate, then that's what I'm going to do. And hopefully what happens is someone will take what I've said and say, hey, did you know so and yeah. so? And then that'll make you go find out information for yourself. You know, right. don't listen to CNN, MSNBC, Fox, you know, the information is out there if you really, really want to know the truth about it. Yeah. And so that's that's really what I I hope when I'm when I'm educating, when I'm talking to people, is that 
they really, something will spark and click inside of them. And they're like, I need to find out more about this. I, I think that. you're absolutely doing that because you, I mean, you just explained many things to me today <laughs> that I didn't know about that now I do know. And I don't, I mean, I'm not the wealth of knowledge on Juneteenth, Juneteenth now, but I know enough that, you know, if I had a friend who, you know, asked me, hey, so what exactly is it? I could actually say something and be like, but look up, you know, look up this a little bit more, or Google this for a little more information, but I do know this. And that, that spreads because I think you're really right when you say anybody who's educated or is willing to learn isn't tolerating any of what no. we're having now no. because they see it as it's not only ridiculous it just doesn't make sense when you know that people being so individual and being so unique helps the world so if you can see that you 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 want to learn things the analogy that i that i gave um in my column is when you go to a doctor the first thing they do is give you the form and they want to know your history your medical history. Right. And they ask you all kinds of questions. Have you ever, did your mom or dad or this or that or that? And the reason why they do that is so they can see the probability that, you know, something may pop up in the, in the future. Or if you already have something, they can see how to treat it. Mm -hmm. It's the same with our history. How can we, the reason why we can't seem to get past, we keep getting stuck when it comes to race we're not writing down everything. We're not studying what's on our racial medical chart. You get what I'm yeah. saying? Mm -hmm. And so because we're not dealing with that issue, we're not treating it, it keeps happening. Yep. You know? Yeah. It keeps happening. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's the metaphor is sinking in. Yeah. We're not dealing with the problem at no. hand. So it's manifesting and right. it's turning into like a bigger thing. And now it's becoming, and a, we're a, passing a it down just like you can pass down high blood pressure and diabetes yep. or whatever. If you don't know what's in your bloodline, then it's going to keep yep, generation keep after generation. And that brings me to something. So I, I wanted, I'm curious what you think about this. Okay. Um, when I speak with my friends, you know, I have friends, uh, I grew up here in this area, I grew up in a more predominantly white area. Okay. So I have more predominantly white close friends. Okay. And we have a lot of conversations about what are we going to do in the future? How can we help? Anytime something happens that we're not, that makes us unhappy and we're uncomfortable with, what can we do? And we always go back to, we can't control the whole world, but what we can control is the way we talk to each other, we talk to each other about our different experiences. A couple of us have children now. So it's like we we need to work on the circle we put ourselves in and the right. circle we put your children, my future children, all our nieces and nephews. And that's how we can help move things forward. And okay. I'm wondering, do you think that's a good way to that's go about good. it? I, it's so funny. I was just having a conversation with one of my friends this morning. And I said, a lot of people have said, I wonder what I would have been doing during the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are. Get it? Yeah. I mean, we're right. I mean, there's so much that's happening now, again, because we haven't dealt with our racial medical history. That was happening back then. We shouldn't still be dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it, like I was telling her, everybody is not going to be out in the, for you know, not everybody's going to be out protesting. Right. Not everybody is going to be out um writing articles or whatever what i what i like to use um numbers like if i were to ask you what equals 10 you might say five plus five someone else might say nine plus one someone else might say seven plus three yeah okay they're all different ways to get to the same thing right and so we just have to like with you and your friends you may be seven plus threes and that's your way to get to that 10, to that unity yeah. that we all seek. And other people, so there's really no wrong way as long as you're doing something and you right. recognize that something needs to happen. Right. I think, okay, <laughs> then we're, we're on the right track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah, all definitely. trying, you know. Sometimes it's like, I want to help. How can I help? You know, and actually not all of us are out in, out there. And I know for me personally, I'm not necessarily always out and about speaking in that sense. But I know when it comes to who's around me or when I hear something I, you know, I know is incorrect. I always kind of speak up and be like, you shouldn't say that. And this is why you shouldn't say exactly. that and, and try to explain. And I haven't had any experience 
where I've explained and took in the time and someone wasn't like, well, took it and was like offended. They were always like, oh, oh my gosh, thank you. I didn't know. Nobody's ever taken the time to explain that to me. That is a huge thing. Just speaking up. There are a lot of people who will sit in a group and hear things and never say anything. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, it, it's like, uh, um, I don't want to misquote Dr. King. And I actually hate quoting um, Dr. King because a lot of people do when they come up, when they, they quote the good parts, but not the other mm-hmm. side of Dr. King. But it's not the, the bad things that people do. It's the silence of our friends that allows things to happen. Yeah. And so for a lot of people just doing that, you hear someone say something and say, you know what? That's not cool. Don't, yeah. I'm not, that's not how I feel. That one little thing, you just never know how that might cause someone else to think about it and say, you know what? I'm going to be more careful or I didn't even realize what I was saying was mm-hmm. racist or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So even that, it, it seems like a small thing, but it really is. It's a little step. It's it's the needle, as everyone talks right. about. If you're trying to move the needle forward, it's tiny, tiny little steps. And I to always do so. tell my students, I always remind them that at the forefront of the civil rights movement were young people. Mm-hmm. They were young. You know, four college freshmen sat down at the uh, Woolworth lunch counter to protest, you know, having segregated places to eat. John Lewis was, what, 19 years old when he walked across, you know, the bridge. So it's like MLK, 26, when he was leading Mark. So young people really, I believe, more than ever need to really let their voices be heard. And people, older people need to listen. Yeah. We need to, because this is the world that they have to live. You know what I'm Mm -hmm. saying? And so we really have to listen, which is why when I give my students uh, discussions, I don't say anything unless they ask me a question, which they don't. I allow them to talk amongst themselves and have the dialogue and they do it in such a beautiful way. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they really do. So with young people, how do you, how do you want to reach them? How do you personally want to reach them in a different way? I know that different mediums. I'm not really a podcast person, but I know pretty much all of my students listen to podcasts. Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. so I'm like, okay, if this is a way to do it, then, hey, let me do it. And you just have to change with the time. You can't be so rigid in your thinking. So there's there's definitely, I think, an education lacking in specifically black communities on their own black history. Right. Um, What are some ways that you think that we can make that better? The church that I attend, Dominion Worship Center in St. Petersburg, on the fourth and fifth Sundays, we teach Black History Bible Study. I mean, mm-hmm. Black History Sunday School. I'm okay. sorry. And that actually started last year during Black History Month. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the other members, Regina Ward and I were talking, and we just decided, like, every Sunday in February last year, we had a Black History Sunday School. Mm-hmm. But the response from members mm-hmm. of the congregation was really big. And we decided to just keep going. So, um that conversation led to, you know, how I've always, again, like I said, love black history. Mm-hmm. And I love that, like with Jewish people, they have Hebrew schools mm-hmm. where they can go and learn, you know, about their culture. And other um, other people have their own schools yeah, to learn really about. Cool. But we don't. We're, we're relegated to a month or we may get a separate black history that's an elective that everybody that you know that you may or may not take but to have like a brick and mortar school that is just to teach us black history it's not like a k through 12 you don't go every day but it's just a facility where people can go and um learn about history and so um our ages all ages all races anybody from zero to 102 you know yeah. how whoever wants to come and just learn about history and so our nonprofit helping hands we we got together we've been discussing we have a building so hopefully we can get that started pretty pretty soon you can you never stop learning i learn every day i hope i never ever ever get to the point where i feel like i know everything right but our history 
in this country as as black people is so rich and so vast and it's just i mean there's so much that we've done that we don't know about and i believe um there's a, a scripture that I used in my Sunday school, Ecclesiastes 2 and 17. Um, and see, this is where my daddy being a preacher is coming out. Um, <laughs> um, that talks about how wisdom preserves people. It's a preserver. So I think about our ancestors, my, my great-grandmother, those people, people who were enslaved. The thing that that preserved them, that got them through slavery, because when you think about how horrific it was was their wisdom okay we can't talk to each other so we'll drum mm. and that's how we'll communicate so then they had to the outlaw drumming okay we can't discuss how to escape so we'll just braid escape routes in our the route you know how to escape in our bra- in our mm-hmm. hair we can't go to the doctor so we'll mix this root with this root and this plant with that plant and you you know yeah and so that wisdom that carried over that brought them from africa here and then the things that were passed down that's one of the tenets of crt is that our oral tradition is considered scholarship because you have some languages that have not been written down but like like Galagichi, the stories, the wisdom, that is scholarship. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like in any family, I'm sure you may have recipes or stories that have been passed down from your great grandma yeah. to your yeah. grandma to you, whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's oral tradition, but it's important. Right. You know, and so the things about our history that weren't written down, but the stories, you know, a lot of people are like, well, if it doesn't have a citation, it's not real. No, I mean, we couldn't. Well, everything didn't have a citation right. at one point. And with <laughs> us, it was illegal to mm-hmm. learn how to read and write and cite and whatever. So we had these stories. I love the idea of this school. It's not <laughs> even just an idea. It's real. Yeah. I can't wait for it to to exist so I can come and yes, learn. Yes. I think that is everyone. an amazing idea. I don't think we have anything like that around here. Oh. Um, I think so many people would enjoy that. I wonder, will we have like a... Like a museum aspect to it, like yes. Oh, I, I have. Yeah, there will be as much as we can. You know, we'll we'll start off small with just the classes. But mm-hmm. I've spoken to several different people who are like, yeah, you know, let me come in. We can teach the importance of names in Africa. You know, yes. what what that is because our way of naming and other people's way is not the same, same. But there's significance in that, and just to learn about because yes, we are. Americans, but um, unlike a lot of different people, we were not granted the privilege of really knowing our full, true history from Africa. Now, you know, and what I'm, what, what we're focused on, because I think a lot of people in the Caribbean, a lot of people in Africa, have their own, like, they are fully aware of their history, and a lot of people grew up in places where there was no racial classification. You mm-hmm. get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Everybody was black. You know, everybody, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so for us, um, it is for the black people who do not still have that connection to the Caribbean, to Africa, to whatever, who only know America as their as home. Who only who only know the history that we were taught in history books. You know, yes. that didn't have people who looked like us. Yeah. And that's that's what I'm classifying as, you know, black um, American. Okay. I love that. So it's going to be, this will be open to anybody to who wants anybody. to learn. But the specifics and the, the focus will be for, you know, black Americans who just don't, haven't had the opportunity to know their own history in any way. And greatness. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of it, like I said, a lot of it is just relegated to slavery and overcoming. Right. But you don't know there's again, all the rich culture. All the rich culture. For for a lot of people, this was so eye opening to me. Um, on The Watchmen, the show that was HBO, mm-hmm. um, the first episode dealt with Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the race massacre. And so many people were like, 
They thought it was fiction because they didn't know about these black Wall Street areas. Well, there were rich, you know, these types of of, of neighborhoods and communities in all tons of cities mm -hmm. where you had rich black people who had their own banks and schools. Right. 22nd Street, the deuces here in St. Pete. That's what that was like. Yeah. And so a lot of people don't know. And I'm sure if they really research in the cities that they're in, they'll find like um, they had these communities. Right. And those are the things you need to know about and what happened. You know, a lot of them were burned down. A lot of them were destroyed. But we've always had the ability and the capacity to do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You've had the good, the bad, but everybody has their own rich experience. You know, my family is, I, I, I call myself African-American. I'm not even sure if that's the correct term, but it's the only way I can think to describe myself because I have parents who weren't born here and came okay. here in their late 20s and 30s. So I have this whole world that they have created that I didn't necessarily live in, but I understand and I've had the food and I've been there right. and I've been very lucky for that because I get to see the the positive parts and not just all the kind of tragic turmoil that we've been climbing through. up the rough side yeah. of the mountain. Parts. Right. There's yeah. been good parts too. And we didn't create that mountain. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We created through that mountain. We were able to push through and have like the Greenwood districts, the deuces and all these other places in spite of. Right. right. Well, that's exactly what this episode <laughs> was for to talk about, all the good things that have happened, even due to being on, you know, right. that rough side of the mountain. So thank you, Double, so thank much so for much being for here. Me. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you for listening to the Arts Access Florida podcast series, When Freedom Rings. You can listen and watch all episodes on the Arts Access Florida YouTube channel. Just search Arts Access Florida. We can't forget to thank our sponsors, Community Foundation Tampa Bay and Gobioff Foundation. This series was created by Malika Hollist and not possible without the help of Adriana Rodriguez and more. This is a product of WUSF Public Media. Copyright 2022, WUSF Public Media.